The Secret of the Arbor Valley, Talbot Mundy. First episode. Chapter 1. Cotswold Omni is no man's fool. If you want views about the world's news, read what Cotswold Omni calls the views papers. There is plenty in them that thoroughly zealous people believe. But remember the wise old ambassador's word of caution to his new subordinate. And above all, no zeal. If you want raw facts devoid of any zeal, whatever try the cafes and the clubs, but you must sort the facts and correlate them for yourself, and whether or not that process shall leave you capable of thought of any kind must depend entirely on your own ability. Thereafter, though you may never again believe a newspaper, you will understand them, and if you are reasonably human, sympathise. There used to be a café in Vienna, where a man might learn enough in fifty minutes to convince him that Europe was riding carelessly to ruin. But that was before 1914, when the riders, using rein and spur at last, rode straight for it. There is still a club in Delhi, where you may pick up odds and ends of information from over the Pamirs, from Nepal, from Samarkand, Turkestan, Arabia, and the Caucasus, all mixed up with fragments from the Ola Podrida of races known collectively as India. And having pieced them all together, you may go mad there, as comfortably as in Colney Hatch, but with this advantage, that nobody will interfere with you, provided you pay your bills on the first of the month and refrain from sitting on two newspapers while you read a third. It is a good club, of the die-hard kind, fairly comfortable, famous for its curry. It has done more to establish empire and to breed ill will than any other dozen institutions. Its members do not boast, but are proud of the fact that no Indian, not even a Maharaja, has ever set foot over its threshold. Yet they are hospitable if a man knows how to procure the proper introduction, no women are admitted on any pretense, and by keeping quiet in a long-armed chair you may receive an education. You may learn, for instance, who is and who is not important, and precisely why. You may come to understand how the old guard, everywhere, inevitably must die in the last ditch, and if you have it in you, you will admire the old guard without trying to pretend that you agree with them. But above all, you may study the naked shape of modern history as she is never written, history in the bathroom, so to speak and once in a while you may piece together a dozen assorted facts into a true story that is worth more than all the printed histories and all the guidebooks added together. Not that the club members realise it. They are usually bored and almost always thinking about income tax and indigestion, coupled with why in thunder so-and-so was fool enough to bid no trumps and trust to his partner to hold the necessary ace. When Omni turned up at the club after three years in a forest, he produced a refreshing ripple on a calm that had grown monotonous. For a week there had been nothing to discuss but politics, in which there is no news nowadays, but only repetition of complaint. But Cotswold Omni, the last of the old-time foresters, and one of the few remaining men in India whom the new democracy has not reduced to a sort of scapegoat rubber stamp, stirred memories and conjecture. His turn for the guillotine. He has done too damned well for twenty years not to have his head cut off. I'll bet you some babu politician gets his job. You'll have to make that bet with Omni if he's mad enough. Didn't you hear poor Willoughby was killed? That leaves Jenkins at the head of Omni's department, and they've hated each other since Jenkins turned down Omni's younger sister, and Omni told him what he thought about it. Not that the girl wasn't fortunate in a way. She married Terry later on and died. Who'd not rather die than have to live with Jenkins? Willoughby always considered Omni to be a reincarnation of Solon or Socrates, plus Aristides crossed on Hypatia. Willoughby. But everybody knew the ins and outs of that news. A fat babu in a dirty pink turban that would have scared any self-respecting horse driving a second-hand Ford with one eye on the Punjabi constabile at the street crossing, bumped into and broke the wheel of Willoughby's dog cart, setting any number of sequences in motion. The horse bolted, tipped out Willoughby, who was killed under a tramcar, and crashed into Amram Chudder's son and company's open storefront, 
where blood from the horse's shoulder spoiled two bales of imported silk. A lawsuit to recover ten times the value of the silk was commenced against Willoughby's estate that afternoon. Mrs. Willoughby had to borrow money from friends to carry on with. The babu put on full speed, naturally, and tried to escape down a side street, of which there are as many and as narrow ones in Delhi as in any city of its size. He ran over a Bengali, which nobody except the Bengali minded very much, knocked down two Sikhs, which was important because they were on their way to a religious ceremony. Righteous indignation is very bad stuff when spilled in the street and finally jammed the ford between a bullock cart and a lamp post, where the pride of Detroit collapsed into scrap. The owner of the bullock cart, a jat with a wart on his nose, which his mother-in-law had always insisted would bring bad luck, she said so at the trial later on, and brought three witnesses to prove it, was carrying for an extortionate price a native of a far northern state who had recently arrived by train without a ticket and who knew how to be prompt and violent. The man from Spiti, which is the name of the northern state, descended from his perch at the rear of the cart, picked up a spoke that the collision had broken away, and hit the babu with it exactly once between the eyes. The babu died neatly without saying anything, and a hot crowd of nine nationalities that was glad to see anybody die with politics the way they had been for a year or two applauded. The man from Spiti vanished. The constabile arrested the owner of the bullock cart, who turned his face skyward and screamed, aye once, which was duly noted in a memorandum book for use as evidence against him. Seventeen onlookers, being questioned, all gave false names and addresses, but swore that the jat with the wart had attacked the babu, and a wakil, which is a person entitled to practice law, who knew all about the jat's recent inheritance from his uncle, offered legal services that were accepted on the spot. Presently, in the jail, a jemadar and two constabiles put the jat through a hideously painful third degree, which left no marks on him, but did induce him to part with money, most of which was spent on a debauch that ended in the jemadar, being reduced to the ranks since the wakil objected on principle to sharing the loot of the jat with anyone, and therefore righteously exposed the Jemadar's abominable drunkenness. Meanwhile, the native papers took the matter up and proved to nine points of decimals that the incident was wholly due to British arrogance and the neglect of public duty by an overpaid alien hegemony, demonstrating, among other things, that the British are a race whose crass materialism is an insult to the spiritual soul of India and whose playing fields of Eton are an ash bed from which arise swarms of phoenixes to suck the lifeblood of conquered peoples. Excellent journalese conceived on the historic principle that if you make sufficient smell, you are sure to annoy somebody, and he who is annoyed will make mistakes, which you may then gleefully expose. The Sikhs who had been knocked down by the ford accused the obsequious servants of alien tyranny, meaning the police, of having tried to prevent them from attending their religious ceremony, the fact being that the police had taken them to the hospital in an ambulance. The entire Sikh community in consequence refused to pay taxes, which set up another sequence of cause and effect, culminating in a yell of Bandamataram as three or four thousand second-year students who were not Sikhs rushed foaming at the mouth into the Channi Chauk, which is a business thoroughfare, with the intention of looting the silversmiths and putting the whole city to the torch. A fire engine dispersed them, but the stream of water from the hose ruined the contents of Chandapal's drugstore. Chandapal called in an actuary who possessed a compound geometrical imagination and sent in a bill to the government that is still unpaid, and having failed to collect immediately, he wrote to a friend who was an undergraduate at Oxford, with the result that a member of parliament for one of the Welsh constituencies asked at question time whether it was true that the Viceroy of India in person had high-handedly confiscated without compensation all the drugs in the Punjab, and if so, why? The answer from the Treasury bench was, no, sir, but the foreign correspondents omitted to mention that, so the French, Scandinavian and United States newspapers had it in headlines that British in India inaugurate new reign of terror, goods confiscated. Revolution threatened.
A bishop in South Africa preached a sermon on the subject. 37 members of the IWDW, who were serving a term in San Quentin, went on a sympathetic hunger strike and were locked up in the dungeon. And a congressman from somewhere in the Middle West wrote a speech that filled five pages of the record. Stocks fell several points. Jenkins stepped into Willoughby's official shoes. However, clocks continued ticking. Roosters crowed. The sun appeared on schedule time, and Willoughby's funeral was marked by dignified simplicity. Except that he hugely regretted his friend Willoughby, Cotswold Omni cared for none of these things. He sat near the electric fan in a corner of the club's smoking room, aware that he was being discussed, but also quite sure that he did not mind it. He had been discussed on and off ever since he came to India. He looked quite unlike Hypatia, whatever Willoughby may have thought of his character. Willoughby overrated him, said somebody. You can't tell me Omni or any other man is such a mixture of marvels as Willoughby made out. Besides, he's a bachelor. Socrates wasn't. Oh, Omni's human, but, well, you know what he's done in that forest. It was raw, red wilderness when he was sent there. Now you can stand on a rock and see ninety miles of trees whichever way you care to look. Besides, dogs love him. Did you see that great dog of his outside? You can't fool that kind of dog, you know. They say he knows the tigers personally and can talk the jungle bat. There was only one other man who ever learned that language, and he committed suicide. All the same, he's not the only man who's done good work, and I've heard stories. Do any of you remember Terry, Jack Terry, the M.D., who married Omni's young sister? One of those delightful madmen who are really so sane that the rest of us can't understand them. Had weird theories about obstetrics nearly got foul of his profession by preaching that music was an absolute necessity at childbirth, wanted the government to train symphony orchestras to play the overture to Leonori while the birth takes place. Perfectly mad, but a corking good surgeon. Always dead broke from handing out his pay to beggars, broke, that is, until he met Marmaduke. Remember Marmaduke? Dead too, isn't he? Wasn't he the American who endowed a mission somewhere in the hills? Yes, at Tilgown. Marmaduke was another madman, absolutely mad, and as gentle as sunrise. Quiet man, who swore like a trooper at the mention of religion. Made his money in Chicago, slaughtering hogs, or so I heard. Wrote a book on astrology that only ran to one edition. I sold my copy for ten times what I paid for it. I tell you, Marmaduke was madder than Gandhi. They say he left America to keep the elders of the church he belonged to from having him locked up in an asylum. The mission he founded at Tilgown caused no end of a stir at the time. Surely you remember that. There were letters to the Times, and an archbishop raised a shindy in the House of Lords. Marmaduke's theory was that, as he couldn't understand Christianity, it was safe to premise that people whose religion was a mixture of degraded Buddhism and devil worship couldn't understand it either. So he founded a Buddhist mission to teach him their own religion. No, he wasn't a Buddhist. I don't know what his religion was. I only know he was a decent fellow, fabulously rich and absolutely mad. He persuaded Jack Terry to chuck the service and become the mission medico, teach hygiene to men from Speedy and Bhutan, like teaching drought to the Atlantic. Jack Terry married Omni's sister about a week before leaving for Tilgown, and none of us ever saw them alive again. Now I remember. There was a nine-day scandal or a mystery or something. You bet there was. Terry and his wife vanished. Marmaduke was carpeted, but couldn't or wouldn't explain, and he died before they could make things hot for him. Then they gave Omni long leave and sent him up to Tilgown to investigate. That was by gad. That was twenty years ago. Good Lord, how time flies. Omni discovered nothing, or if he did discover anything, he said nothing. He's a great hand at doing that by all accounts, but it leaked out that Marmaduke had appointed Omni a trustee under his will. There was another trustee, a red-headed American woman, at least I heard she's red-headed, maybe she isn't, named Hannah Sanborn, who has been running the mission ever since. She was not much more than a girl at the time, I remember. And the third trustee was a Tibetan, 
Nobody had ever heard of him, and I've never met a man who saw him. But I'm told he's a ringding Galong Lama, and I've also heard that Omni has never seen him. The whole thing's a mystery. It doesn't seem particularly discreditable to Omni. What are you hinting at? Nothing. Only Omni has influence. You've noticed, I dare say, he always gets what he goes after. If you ask me, there's an even chance he may get Jenkins if he cares to. That's notorious. Whoever goes after Omni's scalp gets left at the post. What's the secret? I don't know. Nobody seems to. There's Marmaduke's money, of course. Omni handles some of it. I don't suggest fraud or any rot like that, but money's strange stuff. Control of it gives a man power. Omni's influence is out of all proportion to his job. And I've heard, mind you, I don't know how true it is, that he's hand and glove with every political fugitive from the north who has sneaked down south to let the clouds roll by during the last twenty years. They even said Omni was on the inside of the Mopla business. You know the Moplers didn't burn his bungalow. They say he simply asked them not to. Can you beat that? And it's a fact that he stayed in his forest all through that rebellion. Omni was restless over in his corner. His obstinate jaw was only half concealed by a close-clipped, greying beard, and there was grim humour on his lips. Having done more than any living man to pull the sting out of the Mopla rebellion, hints to the contrary hardly amused him. He was angry, obviously angry. However, one man claimed casual acquaintance and dropped into the next chair. Expecting to stay long in Delhi? I don't know. I hope not. Care to sell me that wolfhound? Omni's reserve broke down. He had to talk to somebody. That dog? Sell her? She's the sum total of twenty years' effort. She's all I've done. The Inquisitor leaned back, partly to hide his own face, partly to see Omni's in a more distinct light. He suspected sunstroke or the after-effects of malaria. But Omni, having emerged from his reserve, continued, I don't suppose I'm different from anybody else at least not from any other reasonably decent fellow, made a lot of mistakes, of course, done a lot of things I wish I hadn't, been a bally ass on suitable occasion, but I've worked, damned hard. India has had all the best of me, and damn her, I haven't grudged it, don't regret it either, I'd do it again, but there's nothing to show for it all. Except a forest, they tell me, a forest half-grown, that corrupt politicians will play ducks and drakes with, a couple of thousand villagers who are now being taught by those same politicians that everything they've learned from me is no good. A ruined constitution. And that dog. That's all I can show for twenty years' work. And like some others, I've had my heart in it. I think I know how a missionary feels when his flock walks out on him. I'm a failure. We're all failures. The world is going to pieces under our hands. What I have taught that dog is all I can really claim by way of accomplishment. That particular inquisitor lost enthusiasm. He did not like madmen. He withdrew and considered Omni in a corner behind a newspaper, sotto voce. Another not-so-casual acquaintance dropped into the vacant chair and was greeted with a nod. You've been absent so long you ought to see things with a fresh eye, Omni. Do you think India's breaking up? I've thought so for twenty years. How long before we have to clear out? The sooner the better. For us? I mean for India. I should have thought you would be the last man to say that. You've done your bit. They tell me you've changed a desert into a splendid forest. Do you want to see it all cut down, the lumber wasted, and... Omni pulled out his watch and tapped his finger on the dial. I had it cleaned and repaired recently, he remarked. The man charged me a fair price, but after I had paid the bill, he didn't have the impudence to keep the watch for fear I might ruin it again. India has a perfect right to go to hell her own way. Surgery and hygiene are good, but I don't believe in being governed by the medical profession. Cleaning up corrupted countries is good, but to stay on after we've been asked to quit is bad manners, and they're worse than breaking all Ten Commandments. Besides, we don't know much, or we'd have done much better. You think India is ripe for self-government? When things are ripe, they fall or decay on the tree, said Omni. There's a time to stand aside and let them grow. There's such a thing as too much nursing. Then you're willing to chuck your forest job. I have chucked it. Oh, resigned? Going to draw your pension? No, pension wouldn't be due for two years yet, and I don't need it. 
India has had the use of me for twenty-three years at a fair price. I'd be satisfied if she was. But she isn't, and I'm proud, so I'll be damned if I'll accept a pension. Omni was left alone again. That news of his resignation was too good to be kept, even for a minute. Within five minutes it was all over the club, and men were speculating as to the real reason, since nobody ever gives anyone credit, and wisely, perhaps, for the motives that he makes public. Jenkins has succeeded Willoughby. Omni knows jolly well that Jenkins has it in for him. He's pulling out ahead of the landslide, that's what. I don't believe it. Omni has guts and influence enough to bust ten Jenkinses. There's more than that in it. There never was a man like Omni for keeping secrets up his sleeve. You know he's in the secret service. That's easy to say, but who said so? Believe it or not, I'll bet. I'll bet he stays in India. I'll bet he dies in harness. I'll bet any money in reason he goes straight from here to McGregor's office. More than that, I'll bet McGregor sent for him, and that he didn't resign from the forestry without talking it over with McGregor first. He's deep, is Cotswold Omni. Deep. He's no man's fool. There's no man alive but McGregor who knows what Omni will do next. Anybody want to bet about it? The remainder of the conversation at the club that noon rippled off into widening rings of reminiscence, all set up by Omni's arrival on the scene, and mostly interesting. But to stay and listen would have been to be sidetracked, which is the inevitable fate of gossips. There was a story in the wind that, if the club had known it, would have set all Delhi by the ears. He who would understand the plains must ascend the eternal hills, where a man's eyes scan infinity. But he who would make use of understanding must descend onto the plains, where past and future meet, and men have need of him. Chapter 2 Number 1 of the Secret Service Omni did go straight to McGregor, but he and Diana, his enormous wolfhound, walked and club bets had to be called off because there was no cab driver from whom the Chuprassi could bludgeon information. Neither his nor Diana's temper was improved by the behaviour of the crowd. The dog's size and apparent ferocity cleared a course, but that convenience was not so pleasant as the manners of twenty years ago when men made way for an Englishman without hesitation, without dreaming of doing anything else. The thrice-breathed air of Delhi gave him melancholia. It was not agreeable to see men spit with calculated insolence. The heat made the sweat drip from his beard onto the bosom of a new silk shirt. The smell of over-civilized, unnaturally clothed humans was nauseating. By the time he reached an unimaginably ugly, rawly new administration building, he felt about as sweetly reasonable as a dog with hydrophobia, and was tired, with feet accustomed to the softness and ears used to the silence of long jungle lanes. However, his spirits rose as he approached the steps. He may have made a signal, because the moment the Chuprasi saw him, he straightened himself suddenly and ran before him, upstairs and along a corridor. By the time Omni reached a door with no name on it, at the far end of the building, the Chuprasi was waiting to open it, had already done the announcing, had already seen a said-to-be important personage shown out with scant excuses through another door. The Chuprasi's salam was that of a worshipper of secrets, to a man who knows secrets and can keep them. There is no more marrow-deep obeisance in the world than that. And now, no ceremony. The office door clicked softly with a spring lock and shut out the world that bows and scrapes to hide its enmity and spits to disguise self-conscious meanness. A man sat at a desk and grinned. Sit. Smoke. Take your coat off. Sun in your eyes. Try the other chair. Dog need water. Give her some out of the filter. Now. John McGregor passed cigars and turned his back toward a laden desk. He was a middle-sized, middle-aged man with snow-white hair in a crisp mass that would have been curly if he had let it grow long enough. His white moustache made him look older than his years, but his skin was young and reddish, although that again was offset by crow's feet at the corners of noticeably dark grey eyes. His hands looked like a conjurer's. He could do anything with them even to keeping them perfectly still. So you've actually turned in your resignation. We grow, he remarked, laughing. 
Everything grows except me. I'm in the same old rut. I'll get the axe, get pension someday. Dreadful fate. Did you have your interview with Jenkins? What happened? I can see you had the best of it. But how? Omini laid three letters on the desk, purple ink on faded paper in a woman's handwriting. McGregor laughed aloud, one bark, like the cry of a fox that scents its quarry on the fluke of a changing wind. Perfect, he remarked, picking up the letters and beginning to read the top one. Did you blackmail him? I did. I could have saved you that trouble, you know. I could have broke him. He deserves it, said McGregor, knitting his brows over the letter in his hand. Man, man, he certainly deserves it. If we all got our deserts, the world UD stands still. Omni chose a cigar and bit the end off. He's a more than half-efficient bureaucrat. Let India suck him dry and spew him forth presently to end his days at Surbiton or Cheltenham. McGregor went on reading, holding his breath. Have you read these? he asked, suddenly. Omni nodded. McGregor chewed at his moustache and made noises with his teeth that brought Diana's ears up, cocked alertly. Man, they're pitiful! Imagine a brute like Jenkins having such a hold on anyone, and he, good God, he ought to have been hanged. No, that's too good for him. I suppose there's no human law that covers such a case. None, Omni answered grimly. But I'm pious. I think there's a higher law that adjusts that sort of thing eventually. If not, I'd have killed the brute myself. Listen to this. Don't read them aloud, Mac. It's sacrilege. And I'm raw. It was at least partly my fault. Don't be an idiot. It was, Mac. Elsa wasn't so many years younger than me, but even when we were kids, we were more like father and child than brother and sister. She had the spirituality and the brains. I had the brute strength and was presumed to have the common sense. It made a rather happy combination. As soon as I got settled in the forest, I wrote home to her to come out and keep house for me. I used to trust Jenkins in those days. It was I who introduced them. Jenkins introduced her to Cananda Pal. That swine! No, he wasn't such a swine as Jenkins, said Omni. Cananda Pal was a poor devil who was born into a black art family. He didn't know any better. His father used to make him stare into ink pools and all that devilment before he was knee-high to a duck. He used to do stunts with spooks and things. Jenkins, on the other hand, had a decent heritage and ditched it. It was he who invited Cananda Pal to hypnotize Elsa. Between the two of them, they did a devil's job of it. She almost lost her mind, and Jenkins had the filthy gall to use that as excuse for breaking the engagement. My God! But think if he had married her. Man, man. True, but think of the indecency of making that excuse. I called in Fred Terry. Tophole, generous, gallant, gay. Man, what a delightful fellow Terry was, said McGregor. Did he really fall in love with her? You know, he was recklessly generous enough to... Yes, said Omni. He almost cured her, and he fell in love. She loved him. Don't see how any real woman could have helped it. But Jenkins and Cananda Pal, oh, curse them both. Amen, remarked McGregor. Well, we've got what we want. How did you hear of these letters? Just think of it. That poor girl writing to a brute like Jenkins to give her mind back to her, so that she may, oh my God. I saw Cananda Pal before he died. That was recently. He was quite sorry about his share in the business. He tried to put all the blame on Jenkins. You know how rotters always accuse each other when the cat's out of the bag. He told me of the letters, so I went to Jenkins yesterday, and having resigned, I was in position to be rather blunt. In fact, I was damn blunt. He denied their existence at first, but he handed them over when I explained what I intended to do if he didn't. I wonder why he'd kept them, said McGregor. The pig had kept them to prove she was mad, if anyone should ever accuse him of having wronged her, Omni answered. Do they read like a mad woman's letters? Man, man, they're pitiful. They read like the letters of a drug addict, struggling to throw off the cursed stuff, and all the while crying for it. Lord save us, what a time Fred Terry must have had. Increasingly rarely, said Omni. He had almost cured her. The attacks were intermittent. 
Terry heard of a sacred place in the hills, a sort of Himalayan lords, I take it, and they set off together twenty years ago to find the place. I never found a trace of them, but I heard rumours, and I've always believed they disappeared into the Arbor country. Where they probably were crucified, MacGregor added grimly. I don't know, said Omni. I've heard tales about a mysterious stone in the Arbor country that's supposed to have magic qualities. Terry probably heard about it too, and he was just the man to go in search of it. I've also heard it said that the Masters live in the Arbor Valley. MacGregor shook his head and smiled. Still harping on that string? One hundred million people, at a very conservative estimate, of whom at least a million are thinkers, believe that the Masters exist, Omni retorted. Who are you and I to say they don't? If they do, and if they're in the Arbor Valley, I propose to prove it. MacGregor's smile widened to a grin. Men who are as wise as they are said to be would know how to keep out of sight. The Mahatmas, or Masters as you call them, are a mare's nest, Omni, old man. However, there may be something in the other rumour. By the way, who's this adopted daughter of Miss Sanborn? Never heard of her. You're trustee of the Marmaduke mission, aren't you? Know Miss Sanborn intimately. When did you last see her? A year ago. She comes to Delhi once a year to meet me on the mission business. About once in three years I go to Tilgown. I'm due there now. And you never heard of an adopted daughter? Then listen to this. MacGregor opened a file and produced a letter written in English on cheap ruled paper. This is from number 888. Sirdar Siroha Singh of Tilguan, who has been on the secret roster since before my time. His home is somewhere near the mission. Number 888 to number 1. Important. Miss Sanburn of mission near here did procure fragment of crystal jade by unknown means, same having been broken from antiquity of unknown whereabouts and being reputed to possess mysterious qualities. Miss Sanburn's adopted daughter, get that? Intending to return same, was prevented by theft of fragment, female thief being subsequently murdered by being thrown from precipice, after which fragment disappeared totally. Search for fragment being now conducted by anonymous individuals. Should say much trouble will ensue unless recovery is prompt and secret. Miss Sanburn's adopted daughter, get that again, has vanished. Should advise much precaution not to arouse public curiosity. 888. What do you make of it? asked MacGregor. Nothing. Never heard of an adopted daughter. Then what do you make of this? MacGregor's left hand went into a desk drawer, and something the colour of deep seawater over a sandy bottom flashed in the sunlight as Omni caught it. He held it to the light. It was stone, not more than two inches thick at the thickest part, and rather larger than the palm of his hand. It was so transparent he could see his fingers through it, yet it was almost fabulously green. One side was curved and polished so perfectly that it felt like wet soap to the touch. The other side was nearly a plain surface, only slightly uneven, as if it had been split off from another piece. It looks like jade, said Omni. It is. But did you ever see jade like it? Hold it to the light again. There was not a flaw. The sun shone through it as through glass, except that when the stone was moved, there was a vague obscurity, as if the plane where the breakage had occurred in some way distorted the light. Keep on looking at it, said MacGregor, watching. No, thanks. Omni laid the stone on his knee and deliberately glanced around the room from one object to another. I rebel against that stuff instinctively. You recognize the symptoms? Yes. There's a polished black granite sphere in the crypt of a ruined temple near Darjeeling that produces the same sort of effect when you stare at it. I'm told the Kaaba at Mecca does the same, but that's hearsay. Put the stone in your pocket, said MacGregor. Keep it there a day or two. It's the fragment that's missing from Tilgarn, and you'll discover it has peculiar properties. Talk with Chutterchand about it. He can tell you something interesting. He tried to explain to me, but it's over my head. Secret service kills imagination. I live in a mess of statistics and card indexes that UD mummify a sibyl. All the same, I suspect that piece of jade will help you to trace the Terries, and if you dare to take a crack at the Arbor Country... How did you come by the stone? asked Omni. 
I sent C-99, that's Tin Lal, to Tilgown to look into rumours of trouble up there. Tin Lal used to be a good man, although he was always a thorough-paced rascal. But the service isn't what it used to be, Omni. Even our best men are taking sides nowadays or playing for their own hand. India's going to the dogs. Tin Lal came back and reported everything quiet at Tilgown, said the murders were mere family feuds. But he took that piece of jade to Chutterchand, the jeweller, and offered it for sale. Told a lame duck story. Chutterchand put him off, kept the stone for appraisal, and brought it to me. I provided Tin Lal, naturally, with a year behind the bars. No, not on account of the stone. He had committed plenty of crimes to choose from. I chose a little one just to discipline him. But here's the interesting part. Either Tin Lal talked in the jail, or someone followed him from Tilgown. Anyway, someone traced that piece of jade to this office. I have had an anonymous letter about it, worth attention, interesting. You'll notice it's signed with a glyph. I've never seen a glyph quite like it, and the handwriting is an educated woman's. Read it for yourself. He passed to Omni an exquisitely fashioned silver tube with a cap at either end. Omni shook out a long sheet of very good English writing paper. It was ivory-coloured, heavy, and scented with some kind of incense. There was no date, no address, no signature, except a peculiar glyph, rather like an ancient, much simplified Chinese character. The writing was condensed into the middle of the page, leaving very wide margins, and had been done with a fine steel pen. The stone that was brought from Tilgown by Tin Lal and was offered for sale by him to Chutterchand is one that no honourable man would care to keep from its real owners. There is merit in a good deed, and the reward of him who does justly without thought of reward is tenfold. There are secrets not safe to be pried into. There is light too bright to look into. There is truth more true than can be told. If you will change the colour of the sash on the chuprasi at the front door, one shall present himself to you to whom you may return the stone with absolute assurance that it will reach its real owners. Honesty and happiness are one. The truth comes not to him who is inquisitive, but to him who does what is right and leaves the result to destiny. Omni examined the writing minutely, sniffed the paper, held it to the light, then picked up the tube and examined that. Who brought it? he asked. I don't know. It was handed to the Chuprasi by a native he says he thinks was disguised. Did you try changing the Chuprasi's sash? Naturally. A deaf and dumb man came. He looked like a Tibetan. He approached the Chuprasi and touched his sash, so the Chuprasi brought him up to me. He was unquestionably deaf and dumb, stone deaf, and half of his tongue was missing. The drums of his ears had been bored through when he was a baby, probably. I showed him the stone, and he tried to take it from me. I had to have him forcibly ejected from the office, and of course I had him followed, but he disappeared utterly after wandering aimlessly all over Delhi until nearly midnight. I have had a lookout kept, but he seems to have vanished without trace. Have you drawn any conclusions? McGregor smiled. I never draw them before it's safe to say they're proved, but a young woman almost certainly wrote that letter. Miss Sandburn's adopted daughter, who I don't believe exists, said Omini, is reported by 888, who has hitherto always been reliable, to have disappeared. She disappeared, if she ever did exist, from Tilgown. The stone unquestionably came from Tilgown, and it seems to have been in Miss Sandburn's possession, in the mission. Ergo, just as a flying hypothesis, Miss Sandburn's adopted daughter may have written that letter. If so, she's in Delhi, because the ink on that paper had not been dry more than an hour or two when it reached me. Have you searched the hotels? Of course, and the trains are being watched. I'm curious to meet Hannah Sandburn's adopted daughter, said Omni dryly. I've known Hannah ever since she came to India more than twenty years ago. I've been co-trustee ever since Marmaduke died, and I don't believe Hannah Sandburn has kept a single secret from me. In fact, it has been the other way. She has passed most of her difficult personal problems along to me for solution. 
I have a dozen files full of her letters, of which I dare say five per cent, are purely personal. I think I know all her private business. As recently as last year, when we met here in Delhi, well, never mind, but if she had an adopted daughter or an entanglement of any kind, I think I'd know it. Women are damn deep, MacGregor answered. Well, we've not much to go on. I'll entrust that stone to you. If you're still willing to try to get into the Arbor country, I'll do everything I can to assist. You've a fair excuse for trying, and you're a bachelor. Damn it, if I were, I'd go with you. Of course you understand. If the State Department learns of it, you'll be rounded up and brought back. Do you realize the other difficulties? Sven Hedin is said to have made the last attempt to get through from the north. He failed. In the last hundred years, about a dozen Europeans have had a crack at it. Several died, and none got through, unless Terry and your sister did, and if so, they almost certainly died. When young husband went to Lassa, he considered sending one regiment back by way of the Arbor Valley, but countermanded the order when he realized that a force of 50,000 men wouldn't stand a chance of getting through. From time to time, the government has sent six Gorka spies into the country. None ever came back. It's almost a certainty that the River Changpo of Tibet flows through the valley and becomes the Brahmaputra, lower down. But nobody has proved it. Nor has anyone explained why the Changpo contains more water than the Brahmaputra. Old Kinthup, the pundit on the Indian survey staff, traced the Changpo down as far as the waterfall where it plunges into the Akhba Valley, and he threw a hundred marked logs into the river, which were watched for lower down. But none of the logs appeared at the lower end, and not even Kinthup managed to get into the valley. The strangest part about it is that the northern arbors come down frequently to the southern arbor country to trade, and they even intermarry with the southern arbors. But they never say a word about their valley. The Raja of Tilgaon, the uncle of the present man, caught two and put them to torture, but they died silent. And another strange thing is that nobody knows how the northern arbors get into and out of their country. The river is a lot too swift for boats. The forest seems impenetrable. The cliffs are unclimbable. There was an attempt made last year to explore by airplane, but the attempt failed. There's a 90-mile wind half the time, and some of the passes to the south are 16 or 17,000 feet in the air to begin with. I'm told carburetors won't work, and they can't carry enough fuel. So, if you're determined to make the attempt, slip away secretly, and don't leave your courage behind. If it weren't that you've a right to visit Tilgaon, I should say you'd have no chance, but you might make it if you're awfully discreet and start from the Tilgaon mission. If it's ever found out that I encouraged you. You've been reeling off discouragement for fifteen minutes. Yes, but if it's known I knew, you needn't worry. What made you say you think this stone will help me to trace the Terries? Nothing definite, except that it gives me an excuse for sending you to Tilgown more or less officially. I implore you to investigate the mystery connected with that stone. As far as Tilgown, you're responsible to me. If you decide to go on from there, you'll have to throw me over, disobey orders. You understand? I order you to come straight back here from Tilgown. If you disobey, you do it off your own bat, without my official knowledge. And I'm afraid, old thing, you'll have to pay your own expenses. Omni nodded. See Chutterchand, said MacGregor, and dine with me tonight, not at the club, that you d start all sorts of rumours flying. Say at Mrs. Cornock Campbell's, her husband's away, but that doesn't matter. She's the only woman I ever dared tell secrets to. Leave it to me to contrive the invitation. How'll that do? Mrs. Cornock Campbell is a better man than you or me. Nine o'clock. I'll be there, said Omini, noticing a certain slyness in MacGregor's smile. He bridled at it. Still laughing about the masters, Mac? No, no, I'd forgotten them. Not that they exist, but never mind. What then? I'll tell you after dinner, or rather someone else will. I wonder whether you'll laugh too, or wince. Trot along and have your talk with Chutter Chand. Deciphered from a palm leaf manuscript, discovered in a cave in Hindustan. Those who are acquainted with the day and night knew that the day of Brahma is a thousand revolutions of the Yugas, 
and that the night extendeth for a thousand more. Now the Maha Yuga consisteth of four parts, of which the last, being called the Kali Yuga, is the least, having but four hundred and thirty-two thousand years. The length of a Maha Yuga is four million and three hundred and twenty thousand years, that is, one thousandth part of a day of Brahma. And man was in the beginning, although not as he is now, nor as he will be. There were races in the world, whose wise men knew all the seven principles, so that they understood matter in all its forms and were its masters. They were those to whom gold was as nothing, because they could make it, and for whom the elements brought forth. And there were giants on the earth in those days, and there were dwarfs, most evil. There was war, and they destroyed. Chapter 3 What is Fear? Chutter Chan's shop in the Chandni Chowk is a place of chaos and a joy forever, if you like life musty and assorted. There are diamonds in the window, Kodak cameras, theodolites, bric a brac, second hand rifles, scientific magazines, and a living hamadryad cobra in a wire enclosure into which rats and chickens are introduced at intervals. You enter through a door on either side of which hang curtains that were rather old when Clive was young, and you promptly see your reflection facing you in a mirror that came from Versailles when the French were bribing Indian potentates to keep the English out. Every square foot of the walls within is covered with ancient curios. A glass counter showcase runs the full length of the store and is stuffed with enough jewellery to furnish a pageant of Indian history. Converted into cash, it would finance a very fair-sized bank. Rising to the level of the counter at the rear is a long row of pigeonholed shelves, crowded with ancient books and manuscripts that smell like recently unwound mummies. Between shelf and counter lives, and reputedly sleeps by night, the most efficient jeweller's baboo in India, a meek, alert, weariless man who is said to be able to estimate anyone's bank balance by glancing at him as he enters through the front door. But Chutterchand keeps himself out of sight in a room at the rear of the store, whence he comes out only in emergency. On this particular occasion, there were extra reasons for remaining in the background, reasons suggested by the presence of a special constabile on duty outside the shop door, who eyed Omni nervously as he walked in. Omni went straight to the room at the rear and found Chutterchand at his desk, a wizened, neat little man in a yellow silk turban and a brown alpaca suit of English cut. The suit and his brown skin were almost of the same shade. An amber pin in his yellow necktie corresponded with the colour of his laced shoes. The gold of his heavy watch chain matched the turban. His lemon silk handkerchief matched his socks. His dark brown, kindly, intelligent eyes struck the keynote of the colour harmony. Unlike so many Indians who adopt a modified European style of dress, he had an air of breeding, poise, and distinction. There is always something interesting when you come, Omini, he said, rising and shaking hands. Wait while I remove the specimens from that chair. No, the snakes cannot escape. They are all poisonous, but carefully imprisoned. There, be seated. You are full of news, or you would have asked me how I am. Thank you, I am very well. And you? Now let us get to business. Omni grinned at the jibe, but he had his own way of going about things. He preferred to soak in his surroundings and adjust his mind to the environment in silence before broaching business. He lit a cigar and stared about him at the snakes in cages and the odds and ends of rarities heaped everywhere in indescribable confusion. There were an enormous brass Gautama Buddha resting on iron rollers, a silver Christian crucifix from a Goanese cathedral, and some enamel vases that were new since his last visit. But the same old cobwebs were still in place in the corners of the teak beams, and the same cat came and rubbed herself against his shins until she spied Diana in the outer shop and grew instantly blasphemous. Still saying nothing, Omni at last produced the lump of jade from his hip pocket. Yes, said Chutterchand, I've already seen it. But he took off his gold-rimmed spectacles and wiped them as if he was eager to see it again. What do you know about it? asked Omni. Very little, Saib, 
To crystallize hypothesis into a mistake is all too easy. I prefer to distinguish between knowledge and conjecture. All right, tell me what little you do know. It is jade, undoubtedly, although I have never seen jade exactly like it. I, who have studied every known species of precious and semi-precious stone. Then why do you say it is jade? Because I know that. I have analyzed it. It is chloromelanite, consisting of a silicate of aluminium and sodium, with peroxide of iron, peroxide of manganese, and potash. It has been broken from a greater piece, perhaps from an enormous piece. The example I have previously seen that most resembled this was found in the Karakash Valley of Turkestan, but that was not nearly so transparent. That piece you hold in your hand is more fusible than nephrite, which is the commoner form of jade, and it has a specific gravity of 3.3. What makes you believe it was broken from a larger piece? I know by the arc of the curve of the one side, and by the shape of the fracture on the other, that it has been broken by external violence from a piece considerably larger than itself. I have worked out a law of vibration and fracture that is as interesting in its way as Einstein's law of relativity. Do you understand mathematics? No, I'll take your word for it. What else do you know positively? Positively is the only way to know, the jeweller answered, screwing up his face until he looked almost like a Chinaman. There was human blood on it, a smear on the fractured side that looked as if a careless attempt had been made to wipe it off before the blood was quite dry. Also the print of a woman's thumb and forefinger, plainly visible under the microscope, with several other fingerprints that certainly were tin lals. The stone had come in contact with some oily substance, probably butter, but there was too little of it to determine. Furthermore, I know, Omini, that you are afraid of the stone because to touch it makes you nervous and to peer into it makes you see things you cannot explain. Omini laughed. The stone did make him nervous. Did you see things? he asked. That is how I know it makes you see them, Omoni. Compared to me, you are a child in such respects. If I, who know more than you, nonetheless see things when I peer into that stone, it is logical to my mind that you also see things although possibly not the same things. Knowing the inherent superstition of the human mind, I therefore know you are afraid, just as people were afraid when Galileo told them that the earth moves. Are you afraid of it? asked Omni, shifting his cigar and laying the stone on the desk. What is fear? the jeweller answered. Is it not recognition of something the senses cannot understand and therefore cannot master? I think the fact that we feel a sort of fear is proof that we stand on the threshold of new knowledge, or rather, of knowledge that is new to us as individuals. You mean then, if a policeman's afraid of a burglar, he's... Certainly. He is in a position to learn something he never knew before. That doesn't mean that he will learn, but that he may if he cares to. People used to be afraid of a total eclipse of the sun. Some still are afraid of it. Imagine, if you can, what Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great or Timur Elang or Akbar would have thought of radio or a 36-inch astronomical telescope or a Kodak camera. All those things can be explained. This stone is a mystery. Oh, Moni, everything that we do not yet understand is a mystery. To a pig, it must be a mystery why a man flings turnips to him over the wall of his sty. To that dog of yours, it must be a mystery why you took such care to train her. Look into the stone now, Sahib, and tell me what you see. Not I, said Omni. I've done it twice. You look. Chutterchan took up the stone in both hands and held it in the light from an overhead window. The thing glowed as if full of liquid green fire, yet from ten feet away, Omni could see through it the lines on the palm of the jeweler's hand. Interesting, interesting. Omni, the world is full of things we don't yet know. Chutterchan's brows contracted, the right side more than the left, in the habit-fixed expression of a man whose business is to use a microscope. Two or three times he glanced away and blinked before looking again. Finally, he put the stone back on the desk and wiped his spectacles from force of habit. Our senses, he said 
are much more reliable than the brain that interprets them. We probably all see and hear and smell alike, but no two brains interpret in the same way. Try to describe to me your sensations when you looked into the stone. Almost a brainstorm, said Omni, a rush of thoughts that seem to have no connection with one another, something like modern politics or listening in on the radio when there's loads of interference, only more exasperating, more personal, more inside yourself, as it were. Chutter Chand nodded confirmation. Can you describe the thoughts, Omoni? Do they take the form of words? No, pictures, but pictures of a sort I've never seen, even in dreams, rather horrible. They appear to mean something, but the mind can't grasp them. They're broken off suddenly, begin nowhere and end nowhere. Chutterchand nodded again. Our experiences tally. You will notice that the stone is broken off. It also begins nowhere and ends nowhere. I have measured it carefully. From calculation of the curvature, it is possible to surmise that it may have been broken off from an ellipsoid having a major axis of 17 feet. That would be an immense mass of jade weighing very many tons, and if the whole were as perfect as this fragment, it would be a marvel such as we in our day have not seen. I suspect it to have qualities more remarkable than those of radium, and I think, although, mind you, this is now conjecture, that if we could find the original ellipsoid from which this piece was broken, we would possess the open sesame to, well, to laws and facts of nature, the mere contemplation of which would fill all the lunatic asylums. I have never been so thrilled by anything in all my life. But Omni was not thrilled. He had seen men go mad from exploring without landmarks into the unknown. He laughed cynically. We fools of nature, he quoted, so horridly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls. I'd rather wipe out the asylums. Or live in one, Sahib, and leave the lunatics outside. Shakespeare knew nothing of the atomic construction of the universe. We have advanced since his day, in some respects. Has it occurred to you to wonder how this stone acquired such remarkable qualities? No, you merely wonder at it. But observe, you have seen a pudding stirred. The stupidest cook in the world can pour ingredients into a basin and stir them with water until they become something compounded that does not in the least resemble any one of the component parts. Is that not so? The same fool bakes what he has mixed. A chemical process takes place, and behold, the idiot has wrought a miracle. Again, there is almost no resemblance to what the mixture was before. It even tastes and smells quite differently. It looks different. Its specific gravity is changed. Its properties are altered. It is now digestible. It decomposes at a different speed. It has lost some of the original qualities that went into the mixture and has taken on others that apparently were not there before the chemical process began. You can see the same thing in a foundry, where they mix zinc with copper and produce brass, and the brass has qualities that neither zinc nor copper appears to contain. A deaf and dumb man, knowing neither writing nor arithmetic, could produce brass from zinc and copper. A savage, who never saw an abstraction, can produce wine from grapes. Good. Now listen, Saib. Let us dive beneath the surface of these experiments. The capacity to become brass under certain conditions was inherent to begin with in the zinc and in the copper, was it not? But how so? It was inherent in the atoms of which the zinc and the copper are composed, and behind those again in the electrons of which the atoms are composed. Let us then consider the electrons. Suppose that we knew how to pour electrons into a receptacle and make, so to speak, a pudding of them. Could we not work what the world would think are miracles? I have made diamonds in my workshop. I believe I can make gold. What could I not do if I knew how to manage electrons in the raw? Electrons, in every one of which is the capacity to become absolutely anything. It has possibly not occurred to you, Omoni, but the more I pursue my studies, the more I am convinced that there was once a race of people in the world, or possibly a school of scientists drawn from many then-existent races who knew how to manage electrons. I think they lived simultaneously with the cavemen. We find the bones of cavemen because those were ignorant people, 
such as the Bushmen of today, who buried their dead. We do not find the bones of the scientists of that period because they were enlightened and disposed of corpses in the fire. The art of the cavemen is evidence that there was art of a very high order which someone presumably taught. They painted pictures in caves into which no sunlight penetrated. Therefore, there must have been artificial light of a sort superior to torches or tallow candles, because otherwise the colour work would have been impossible. That is proof that there was science in those days, of which the cavemen could avail themselves just as today a lunatic may use electric light. And the fact that we find no traces at present of what we can recognise as a very high order of civilization, then existent is no proof that there was none. It may have been totally different from anything with which we are familiar. Furthermore, the world has only been extremely superficially explored. Be patient, Omoni. I am coming to my point. I have studied that piece of jade. Three days and nights I studied it without sleep. To me, its peculiar properties appear to confirm observations, microphotographic observations that I have made and recorded during a period of ten years. In its essence, what is photography? It is the practice, by means of chemicals, of rendering visible to the human eye impressions of objects produced by light on a prepared surface. It is necessary to prepare the surface, which we call a dry plate or a film, because we do not yet know how else to render the light-made impression visible to the human eye. But it is there, whether we make it visible or not. And what I have discovered is this, that every particle of matter has a photographic quality, which varies only in degree. You stand against a rock, and not necessarily in sunlight, although sunlight helps. Your impression is indelibly photographed on that rock, as I can prove if you have time to witness some experiments. It is photographed on anything against which you stand. Other images may be superimposed on yours, but yours remains. In rare instances, in certain atmospheric conditions, these impressions become visible without any other chemical process, although it seems to require a certain nervous state of alertness before the human eye can perceive them. You remember the case of the Brahmin who hanged himself in a cellar not far from this shop of mine. His body hung there for a day before they found it. For weeks afterward, what was supposed to be his ghost was seen by scores of reputable witnesses hanging from the beam. That was several years ago. There was a great stir made about it at the time, and there were letters to the newspapers stating instances of similar occurrences. There was an investigation by experts from a research society who denounced the whole story as an imposture. However, I was one of those who saw the ghost, and I made notes and some experiments. Finally, I photographed it. That satisfied me. I am sure that the alleged ghost was nothing but a photograph made on the wall, and that it was rendered visible by certain chemical conditions, not all of which I have been able to ascertain. Now then. If that is possible in one instance, it is possible in every instance. There is no such thing as an exception in nature. We have discovered a law. So take this piece of jade. We see things when we look into it. I deduce that they are photographic, and because no other piece of stone that I know of has the same quality of receiving impressions that are instantaneously visible, it seems probable to me that it has been intelligently treated by someone who knew how to do that. It might be a natural chemical process, said Omni. I think not. Have you noticed that the strange moving images visible within the stone are not the reflections of objects? The stone is not a mirror in the ordinary sense. It does not seem to reflect at all the objects that surround it. I have never succeeded in seeing my face in it, for instance, although I have tried repeatedly in all sorts of light from every angle. It appears to me to reflect thought. Omni made the peculiar noise between tongue and teeth that suggests polite but otherwise unconditioned incredulity. Chutter Chand, deep in his theme, ignored the interruption. I believe it reflects character. I believe that every thought that every man thinks, from the day he is born until the day he dies, leaves an invisible impress on his mind as well as a visible impress on his body. You know how changing character affects the lines on the palm of a man's hand, on the soles of his feet, at the corners of his eyes, at his mouth, and so on. 
Well, something of the same sort goes on in his mind, which is invisible and what we call intangible, but is nevertheless made up of electrons in motion. And those impressions are permanent. I believe that somebody who knew how to manipulate electrons has treated this stone in such a way that it reflects the whole of a man's thought since he was born, just as a stone wall, if it could be treated properly, could be shown to retain the photograph of every object that had passed before it since the wall was built. I believe this was done very anciently, and for this reason, that if anyone possessed of such intelligence and skill were alive in the world today, his intelligence would burn itself into our consciousness so that we could not help but know of him. I am of opinion that the process to which the jade was subjected rendered it at the same time transparent, because it is not in the nature of jade to be quite transparent normally, and in my mind there is connected with all this the knowledge, which is common property, that the Chinese, a very ancient race, regard jade as a sacred stone. Why? Is it not possible that jade peculiarly lends itself to this treatment, and that, though the science is forgotten, the dim memory of the peculiar property of the stone persists? You've a fine imagination, said Omini. And what is imagination, Omini, if not a bridge between the known and unknown, between conventional so-called knowledge and the unexplored realm of truth? Have you no imagination? Electricity was possible a thousand years ago, but until imagination hinted at the possibility, who had the use of it? Omni returned the stone to his pocket. He was interested, and he liked Chutter Chand, but it occurred to him that he was wasting time. You're right, of course, he said, that we have to imagine a thing before we can begin to understand it, or produce, or make it. Surely, you imagined your forest, Omni, before you planted it, but between imagination and production, there is labor. You see, what the West can't understand it scoffs at, whereas what the East can't understand it calls sacred and guards against all comers, I think you will have to penetrate a secret that has been guarded for thousands of years. They say, you know, that there are masters who guard these secrets and let them out a little at a time. May the gods whom you happen to vote for be grateful and assist you. I would like to go on the adventure with you, but I am a family man. I am afraid. I am not strong. That stone has thrilled me, Omoni. If you like, I'll leave it with you for some more experiments, said Omoni. Saib, my friend, I wouldn't keep it for a Raja's ransom. It was traced to this place. How, I don't know. You noticed the policeman at the door. He is put there to keep out murderers. There has been a ruffian here, a hillman, a cutthroat who said he came from Spitty, a great savage with a saw-edged tulwar. Ugh, he demanded the stone. He demanded to know where it was. If it had not been that I had a shop full of customers and that I promised to try to get the stone back from the man who now had it, he would have cut me in halves. He said so. I am afraid all the time that he will return or that some of his friends will come. Oh, I wish I had your lack of an imagination, Omoni. I could feel his saw-edged tulwar plunging into me. Listen. Chutter Chand began to tremble visibly. Who is that? Omni glanced into the shop. There were two men, evidently unarmed, or the constabile would never have admitted them, standing talking to the clerk across the showcase counter. One was apparently a very old man, and the other very young. Both were dressed in the Tibetan costume, but the older man was speaking English, which was of itself sufficiently remarkable, and he appeared to be slightly amused because the clerk insisted that Chutterchand was absent on a journey. Neither man paid the slightest attention to the jewellery in the showcase. They were evidently bent on seeing Chutterchand and nothing else. Admit him, whispered Omini. I'll hide. No, never mind the dog. She'll follow them in and sniff them over. If they ask about the dog, say she belongs to one of your customers who left her in your charge for an hour or two. What's behind that brass Buddha? Nothing, Sahib. It is hollow. There is no back. That'll do then. Help me pull it out from the wall. Quick, quiet. They made rather a lot of noise, and Diana came in to investigate, which was opportune. 
Omini gave her orders sotto voce, and she returned into the shop to watch the two curious visitors. Now don't let yourself get frightened out of your wits, Chutter Chand. Encourage them to talk. Ask any idiotic question that occurs to you. When they're ready to go, let them. And then, whatever you do, don't say a word to the policeman. Omni stepped behind the image of the Buddha. Chutter Chand, leaning all his weight against it, shoved it back nearly into place, but left sufficient space between it and the wall for Omni to see into an old cracked mirror that reflected almost everything in the room. Then, taking a visible hold on his emotions, Chutter Chand strode to the door and stood there for a moment, looking, listening, trying to breathe normally. He forced a smile at last. Oh, let them in. I will talk to them, he said to the clerk in English, with an air of almost perfect, patronising nonchalance. Only a very close observer might have known he was afraid, that fear, perhaps, in him was more than recognition of something that the senses do not understand. 